and welcome to the episode number five of the Introvert Biz Growth Podcast, the show where I talk to introverts who grow their business and make a difference. I'm Sarah Sinecroce and thrilled that you're spending this time with me today. Today, I'm excited to have my first male guest. Yes, of course, there's such thing as male introverted business owners as well. And Ian tells me that he's definitely an introvert. Ian Brody helps consultants and coaches to attract and win more clients. He's been named as one of the top 50 global thought leaders in marketing and sales, and his website has been named as one of the resources of the decade for professional services marketing. He's also the author of the Amazon number one bestseller, Email Persuasion. He describes himself as the world's least natural salesperson, and it's because he found selling so uncomfortable that he found ways of making it easier and more natural for himself and teaches those methods to others like him. How are you today? I am excellent today. Just got back from a lovely walk in the sun, so I'm raring to go. Excellent. Well, as I said before, offline, it's raining here today, but, oh. um, you know, we, we kind of exchange um, sometimes. Yes, we're getting you back. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, Ian, besides your official bio, can you tell us a little something our introverted audience can relate to, something that's, you know, maybe not on your website uh, where you feel that the introverts can really relate to? Well, I guess I think it's kind of my, my, my background. You know, these days I work in marketing and, uh, and and sales, and that feels like a very extrovert topic. But my background is I did a, a degree in mathematics, um, and then I went on to work in um, technology and IT. I actually worked in R&D, um, kind of in the background, um, teaching computers how to fix themselves, which sounds all a bit... A bit spooky, really, but it's about kind of diagnosing their own problems and figuring out what the, the right solution might be, etc. And I spent about six or seven years doing that. Um, and that was really my background, just working on computery type stuff. And, um, you know, I, I still enjoy that I still. But I got a, a lot from just working with technology and computers because it didn't really involve much talking to people, to be frank. And yeah, it, it sounds very geeky. <laughs> it was very geeky. That was my background. Now, I ended up being a project manager. Um, for the you know kind of getting promoted becoming a project manager and then running a little team um, and for that I ended up that my company sponsored me to go on an MBA and learn kind of business schools and they wanted me to become a better manager um, but what I discovered partly through the the MBA and partly through my later experiences in consulting was I do I don't really enjoy being a manager um, I, I get my enjoyment from the work itself um, rather than from managing other people who are doing the work uh, so I ended up through the MBA discovering marketing, discovering business strategy, really enjoying that and kind of switching careers to consulting as a result. Um, but then it was it was a kind of like a massive shock for me because when I'd been working in R&D for the technology company, you know, all the computers were sold by other people. Hmm. Um, you know, I was just in the background programming things and, and, and coming up with ideas. And it was other people who went out and, and sold the computers and things like that. Whereas, of course, when you're in consulting, Yes, some of the work is actually quite technical. You look at spreadsheets, you do analysis of industry trends and all that kind of stuff. But as you get more and more senior, um, if you want to, to work on interesting projects and get promoted, you actually have to talk to clients and, uh, and sell projects. And that was something completely new for me. The, the was a, a real shock, to be honest, at the time. It was like, oh, I can't succeed just by being technically excellent, which is what I'd always done in the past. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I have. I, I. I can only succeed if I actually, you know, if people buy things from me and I have to sell things, and I was really uncomfortable with that. Hmm. So you had to learn to actually go out there and, and talk to people, even though it was maybe not your biggest strength. Yeah, and and in a way, learn to do it in a way that that was okay for me because I couldn't, and that was that was definitely a learning early on. Is I'd I'd been I went on a couple of you know we had the firm I was in. I, excellent resources, really good training courses and all that kind of stuff to help you. I wasn't just dropped in it. I had mentors, I had people helping me, I had training courses. But a lot of the training courses, you'd go on and the training courses were done by and written by 
people who felt completely comfortable going out and talking to new people and making new relationships, all that kind of schmoozing type stuff. Um, so initially I tried to kind of model them and do what they were doing, but it really didn't work for me because I wasn't them. I didn't feel comfortable doing the things they did. And so, and the people I was learning from were kind of, you know, I was kind of in my thirties at the time and they were in the fifties They each, you know, the guy teaching the first course I went on about building executive relationships had been the managing director of a multi-million dollar business. So he was kind of sitting across the, the table from clients at a peer to peer level. And of course I wasn't, I'd just been a little techie guy, a <laughs> geeky guy. And I just didn't feel comfortable talking in the same way to people. Mm. Um, and I don't think they, were, they felt comfortable talking to me in that way. I wasn't a peer, let's be frank. I was not a peer of a senior executive in a client organization. So it took a little bit, of, a little while and, you know, some good coaching from people for me to realize that actually you don't have to sell like that. You can sell based on what you're good at, which is your expertise. You know, the clients are interested in working with you because you're really good at something. You don't have to pretend you're a peer of them and you've run a big business like they have and they're buying from you because you're advising them as a peer. They're buying from you because you have expertise that they need. Right. So it's a different kind of style to it that, that I learned. So is that what you're doing with your, your clients right now? Is that what you're teaching them? Yes, I think so. I mean, there's obviously lots of elements to it. Um, and there are lots of core things in marketing and sales that apply no matter who you are. But... I think it, it it is really important, and especially for injuries. I mean, the people who who I work with are across the spectrum, but especially if you're an if you're an introvert, um, you have to learn to market and sell in a way that works for you. And it's important to recognise that there are ways that work for you. There isn't just one model of marketing and selling that works for everyone. Um, I we had a really interesting experience this last weekend. We were buying a new car for my wife, Kathy, um, and before and I was talking to my friend Roy, who, who does our gardens. And I was saying, I'm not really looking forward to it. I hate being sold to, you know, the car showrooms and things. <laughs> and I really hate all that negotiation and stuff. And Roy said, oh, I love all that. So I love, I love, you know, kind of haggling and getting the price down. I thought, oh, no. And, <laughs> it's and, the worst for me, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we, we ended up going out um, to see a couple of car showrooms. And the first one was that typical professional salesperson, all sorts of buzz in the office, loads of people, all with their smart suits. And they had all the script and all the patter, et cetera, and all the, the right things to see. And the second one we went to was much smaller, just a guy with in his kind of jeans. And, you know, he was very well kept, but he wasn't fancily dressed. He was very quiet. He just showed us the car, went for a drive in it, um, came back. Kathy just chatted to him. and But at the end, she and I felt much more comfortable with him than we did with the professional salespeople. Right. Now, that, that's not that the, his model is the right model. His model worked for us. It works for you, yeah, because you felt yeah, that there is a synergy somehow. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But with Roy, if Roy had been there, he'd have felt much more at home with the professional salespeople, yeah. you know, having a bit of banter, chatting with them, having some jokes, you know, then haggling them and negotiating with them. He'd have been really at home with the professional salespeople. So I think it's important to remember that sometimes I think we think either everyone is like us or no one is like us. We are very black and white, aren't we, in our thinking sometimes. And uh, and the truth is, it's always somewhere in between. You know, there there will, no matter who you are, there will, will always be people who think like you and act like you and are similar to you and will appreciate your your style and the way you work. So that I think the important thing is to find more of them. You know, I, I always say with my clients when they're doing their marketing, you know, they, they can kind of contrast them um, when it comes to, and it's why marketing is so important. If you're sitting in front of a, a potential client, you know, think of your very best ever client who you love working with and, you know, you've had a great times with, you really get on well together, you're kind of in sync. And then think of the worst ever sales meetings you've had where the, the person just isn't listening, do, doesn't seem to be interested, doesn't respect you. And a lot of sales training seems to start off with the person who's the, you know, the awful prospect and teach you techniques for convincing them to buy from you. Yeah. Um, but, you know, well, it just struck me that, well, surely the be a better thing to do is to have less meetings with that sort of person and end up with more meetings with the sort of person you really do want to work with, where it's easy and it flows naturally. Of course, you because you're being yourself. Things. That's right. You, mm -hmm. you know, if you are talking to people who appreciate who you are and you're yourself and, and you connect with them and you click, 
then you don't you need to use fancy sales techniques and and all that kind of stuff it just flows so that that's as i say why marketing i think is so important because it gets you in front of the right people to make selling much more easy mm. because it then becomes natural let me ask you this and do you do any speaking events where you you know go and big to big conferences and, and and are a speaker at these events I do and I don't. Um, that's a strange answer. I, I, I quite enjoy it. I'm mm -hmm. not focusing on it right now. I'm, most of my stuff is focused online. So I do quite a lot of webinars, podcasts like this. Okay. Um, I speak at big summits and things online. I do the occasional ones. I spoke at the UK's kind of biggest social media conference last year. Um, but I don't do a lot. Mm -hmm. But weirdly, and this I, I found this strange for us. So I'm a member of, in the UK, the Professional Speaking Association. Okay. Um, and I was very surprised to find out when I joined that association how many introverts there are in the association. You'd have thought that people who speak on stage are all kind of extroverts. But what, what I found was there's a lot of people who are very comfortable speaking on stage uh, because in a way it's just them. Yes. It's them performing. But then when it comes to the networking afterwards or beforehand where they actually have to go out and talk to people one-to-one -one or in small groups, they're absolutely petrified of that. Yeah. that they're kind of absolutely fine standing up in front of, on a stage in front of a thousand people. Um, but then if they had to go and talk and chat to and introduce themselves to five people over drinks, they, they, they freeze. And I'm, and I'm a bit like that. I, yeah, I'm totally like that too. Just, you know, I don't mind being on stage at all and I, because it's just me. I don't really... Not that I don't pay attention to the audience, but you, you know what I mean? It's, it doesn't feel like I have to... Yeah, and it makes the networking afterwards easier too because people already know who you are and they're, they're all coming to you. You don't have to go to them. That's so. a very good point. You, the, the, you don't have to introduce yourself. You don't have to come up with smart topics of conversation. Yeah, you don't have exactly. to do the old elevator pitch because they know who you are exactly. and they lead the thing. That's yeah, a good point. Yeah. All right, let me uh, switch gear and let's talk a little bit about revenue because... I looked at your site and you have all these different products and services. So how do you currently generate revenue? Okay, about, I would say about 80% of my revenue just comes from one of those products, which is my ongoing membership program. So people will sign up um, for a membership club called Momentum Club. And basically it's a kind of reference library, a resource library of all the best marketing and sales training that I have for consultants and coaches and trainers, people like that, who, who have a service that they either do face to face with people, they do virtually, or maybe they do kind of online training with, with their expertise. And that's kind of, you know, it's training videos, it's a monthly webinar, it's interaction with me and asking questions on a forum, it's me doing reviews of their marketing once a month. Um, and of course, it's the community as well of all the other people who are in similar positions that nobody joins for the community but actually that's why people stay it's that it's a really great to have people supporting you who are in similar positions to you so that that's about 80 percent of my revenue and then the rest is kind of come comes related to that so i have a program for people who um, sell to corporate organizations so so you know it's slightly different when you're marketing to a big corporate organization the decision making process is much more complex Definitely. um there are you know you got to go through all sorts of procurement hoops etc so that's not all of my not all of my clients are in that situation, so I have an additional product which just deals with that. I have an additional one on Facebook advertising or whatever. So, But they kind of sit at the side, and the real core, and I think this is quite, I don't know how many people listening run their own business or, or, or solo professionals, but I think when you're doing your own thing and there's just you, I think it's really quite important to, to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. um, and in my case, about as I say, about 80% comes from this one product which means that I'm not having to constantly um, create new things every time. I'm not in constant launch mode of here's a new great thing, everybody buy this, then here's another great thing, everybody buy this. It's just the one thing that I, I steer people towards. You know, if you want to learn how to market and sell successfully as a consultant or a coach or a trainer, this will do it for you. Um, and uh, so, so go down that route and it keeps it keeps it simple for me. I think that's a very good point because a, a lot of business owners are so overwhelmed because they feel like they have to do, you know, constant launches and constant new products and, and, and everything. And it, and it gets really overwhelming where what you found is, is this membership program where, yes, you probably add new content all the time yeah. but it's in the same kind of shell you know you don't That's have to right. relaunch it. and i'm not launching all the time which, yes. which i think you know and you see all these stories of people making millions from their launches etc but most of the people i speak to who do launches don't make don't make millions 
um, and it, it becomes very up and down for them. You know, you've got to do another one, then you've got to do another one. Whereas, you know, with the evergreen model, it takes longer to get established. So when I was building the membership program, you know, I started with two members, <laughs> and two members doesn't pay the bills really. No, <laughs> yeah. ninety-seven dollars a month. Yeah. So um, it was a lot of work to create all the content and to keep it going. Um, and so I obviously had to do other things. I was doing coaching, I was doing live training and stuff like that while I was building the membership program. But the membership program grew nicely over, you know, over a couple of years. And, you know, once you hit 100 people in the membership program, all of a sudden you don't need to do all the other things and it becomes a steady stream of income. And yes, sure, you get some new members every month and you lose a couple of members maybe every month, but it's fairly consistent. Mm. Um, and it means you don't have to you know, wake up at the start of every month thinking, oh my word, where's my money going to come from this month? Yeah, no, that's very that's very scary. Every month you yeah. don't know, you know, are you going to pay the bills or not? But I also like you know, your honesty that you're, you are saying that it took some time oh, yeah. uh, to build this because... You know, sometimes we only hear the tip of the iceberg of, of people's stories and like they made millions and from their launches. But yeah, maybe they had 10 other launches before that that didn't make them millions or didn't even make them a buck. So yeah, I think it's important to to realize that all the success stories that we hear out there, well, they're usually based on many failures or not failures, but many tries, you know? Yeah, and of course, so. we, what we don't hear is the people who've done exactly the same thing but never got anywhere. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, they're, they're the kind of survivor syndrome in yeah. survival bias that you don't hear the stories of the people who just go out of business, have to get a job and stuff like that. So yeah. you can't just listen to the success stories. Um, or you can, but, um, you know, I'm... I'm relatively conservative in terms of taking risks in business and I like to do things a little bit of it at a time and so you know I can do a launch now because I have the membership program going so if I did a launch and it didn't work you know I'd still be able to pay the mortgage out like yes. I don't have a mortgage anymore but you know I'd still be able to pay the bills um, next month um, because of the membership program so I think it's important to establish a stable income first and then build from there. I really don't like this. You hear it so many times, people saying, you know, you know, you really have to go big to make it make a success and then, you know, borrow all sorts of money on your credit cards to buy this program. And it's like, oh no, don't, you know, look after your family first mm -hmm. and make sure you can pay the bills next month. And, you know, I always tell people who are thinking, as soon as I get people emailing me and saying, look, you know, money's really tight at the minute. Um, you know, 97 a month is quite a lot for us. You know, do you think it's worth it? And the answer is, for, I always go back to say, no, if you know, if if you can't afford the 97 a month comfortably, then use all the free material I give away, um, and and get get your business going with that, or you know, stick at your job a bit longer and earn a, and you know, build a little nest egg, um, so you you have got the comfort that when you you know, like when I quit my job, we had six months of kind of nest egg to live to live on, setting up our own business. So that you knew you didn't have to, because that puts tremendous pressure on people, knowing that they have to do something amazing just to pay the bills next month. I, mm -hmm. I don't think, and again, there are loads of stories of people of people who went into tremendous debt, and it was that pressure that made the you know made them work harder, etc. But of course, you don't hear the stories of the people who go into debt and never make it out, and it ruins their lives. So I. That's not something I. Yeah, you know, or, not a model I like. Not a model I like. Yeah, yeah. Or they end up with a you know burnout and because they were trying so hard and yeah and just worked yeah worked like crazy and didn't get them anywhere. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I yeah. definitely be believe the same thing. Excellent. Um, let's talk about your superpowers, introverted superpowers. I like to call them uh, until I find a better name because. I'm, oh no, that's a good name. It's a good name. I'm not a big superhero fan, but anyway, that's the best I could come up with so far. So, what do you think? Um, what would you say is your biggest stre strength in terms of um, being an introverted entrepreneur? I would say it's probably obsession. Obsession. In, okay. in the sense of, if I get interested in something. I will, you know, I'm a bit older now, but I used to stay up for 48 hours with no sleep, just following up on that one thing. You know, in fact, I remember when I was doing consulting work and we had a big client workshop the next day um, and we were struggling for ideas or whatever. And we, we had some good stuff to, to do with them, but I was sure there was a, you know, a breakthrough we could have if we just thought things through differently. And I remember about seven o'clock in the evening before, suddenly the idea happened. And I thought, oh, if we just look at it this way. And then once I'd had that idea, I could not do anything but work on it. 
So I, I just followed up on that idea, kept thinking it through, drawing models. I stayed up all night, all the next day. So I just worked through 48 hours, um, you know, just just c continue working on that thing because I was obsessed with that idea. Now, I'm a bit older now and I don't quite do the silly not sleeping stuff so much. But if I am really interested in something, I can devote tremendous energy into researching every last little piece of information there's ever been on it, testing it out to the nth degree and really getting into it not you know not doing it superficially yeah, and i think that's a really, mm -hmm. absolutely and it, it you know i know pe some people like like everyone i get bored with things and move on but I, it, it's kind of once i am interested in something i really go deep into it and i think that that makes it really helpful for example for my clients who are in the membership program they know that if i'm teaching them something i will have absolutely thoroughly and completely done it myself um you know interviewed or spoken to a lot of people who are doing it so it's not a superficial treatment um and I, I think that does come a little bit from being an introvert because i'm very very happy um happiest you know just sitting at my computer researching stuff reading a book and going through all the details on something i don't need to reach out and talk to people and keep entertained or anything like that right. the learning process itself for me is the entertainment and the joy of just going deep into something yeah, yeah, I, I, I totally understand it. it. You don't need the audience. You don't need the feedback necessarily no, because no. you do all the research. Yeah. That's right. I just, yeah. you know, you, you see something and the, 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 the pleasure, the payoff for me is in knowing something, in finding out something that nobody else knows mm -hmm. or very few other people know or finding out the, la you know, a new twist on something yeah. and del delving deep into that is just, just lo lovely when you discover something new. Nice. Yeah, I just recently worked on my core desired feelings and there's I decided on four feelings that I want to feel on a daily basis. And one is curiosity. Mm. And, and, and I think that's kind of, you know, similar. It's like, you're just, you just always want to learn and you want to mm. learn new things and discover new things. So absolutely. I think that's the Can trigger that starts it is the curiosity of, I wonder what that is. Yeah. How does that work? I really want to know. And then of course you, you can't, you can't stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. What about the, um, not a weakness, but let's call it a challenge. Uh, as an introverted entrepreneur? Um, yeah, I I suppose like a lot of introverts, I am very, very uncomfortable reaching in, in, in like groups in social situations. I just, you know, at a party, I'll, I'll just sit by myself or talk to my wife or whatever. I, you know, if I know someone, great, but I will really uncomfortable introducing myself to new people. You know, I, I, and that same happens for networking and stuff like that. And I, I've, I've, been on the training i've forced myself to do it in the past but it but it's not something i enjoy doing i don't really enjoy phone calls either i don't i keep i keep getting it's great if it's a podcast or something like this where we can talk about some real kind of content but you know i'll get i'll get people say you know email me and say you know hi you know i've had this idea do, do, can we get on the phone for 10 minutes just to chat and i can go oh can't you just email it to me <laughs> <laughs> i'm much better just yeah. responding on email i don't want to get on the phone and talk to people and, yeah it's funny because even on the phone you don't have to see each other but for me it's the same thing i don't i'd rather just you know send a quick email yeah uh, no i just, <laughs> and people don't understand it it's like for them because they're not like that i mean i remember i got invited to kind of talk on a summit um a while ago and i felt really bad because the, the lady emailed me said i'm thinking of doing this summit on this topic um and i uh, you know would you be interested and i emailed back and said uh yeah, but tell me a little bit more about what, you know, what do you mean by the topic? Because it could, could mean a couple of different things. And she kind of emailed back and said, oh, let's just jump on a call for 10 minutes. I'll explain. <laughs> and I went, oh, no, please, no. Uh, just, can you yeah. just say it in the email? And she, we went backwards and forwards. Oh, well, it would be really much easier for me to explain. And I said, but, yeah, but I don't like, I feel uncomfortable on phone calls. I worry that people are trying to sell stuff to me. That, and I'll say yes, <laughs> because I, I don't like to... Mm -hmm. I don't like to say no to people, so I prefer not to put myself in that situation. So, yeah. and that obviously help doesn't help as an entrepreneur because, I mean, I have found ways of marketing and selling where I don't need to do that, but I do know that sometimes it would just be easier if I got on the phone or if I went out and met people, and you know that would save a lot of faffing around. <laughs> but, but I, I but I don't enjoy it. So, I mean, again, I think you can. It's a weakness. 
some things would be easier for me if I could do that comfortably, but I guess I'm lucky enough that I don't have to do that. Yeah, and that's why you built an online business as well, because yes. you don't want to go and, you know, meet everybody at the local bar and, you know, chat over beers or whatever. Absolutely, absolutely. Because, and uh, it does, yeah. it does I, I, you know, I sometimes chat with, you know, get involved in a conversation on Facebook or whatever, and you'll see people, especially in the speaking world, where people say, "Oh, because a lot, there are the, quite a few people who, who extroverts as well," and they're, you know, oh, the absolute best way of winning business. You know, the ninety percent of my business came from my network and going out and talking to people and having a chat over coffee, and that's the way. And I just keep thinking, "Oh, I can't think of anything more horrific." Yeah, 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 not same for <laughs> I'm me. I'm really glad my my business doesn't work that way. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of uh, introverts can relate to that. <laughs> so let's talk about, uh, I always like to share uh, three golden nuggets, kind of like uh, personal resources that uh, you think contribute contributed to your success. So the first one is a personal habit, something that you do on a daily or weekly basis. Okay, I am normally really bad at planning and organizing. It's not my thing. Um, I'm very disorganized. Um, but obviously, <laughs> running your own business, you need to be relatively well organized. So what I discovered that really works for me is I will have what I call my, my planning meeting um, every Monday morning. My wife makes fun of me. I go off. I sit in a coffee shop for two hours. Um, she, when I come back, she always laughs and say, how did your planning meeting go? Did you meet any nice people? Because I just sit there quietly by myself <laughs> with a cup of coffee and I get my big list of projects I'm working on. And I look through each one and I say, well, out of those projects, what do I need to do on those projects this week? And I make a kind of a bulleted list of the top three or four things I need to achieve this week. And then I look at my kind of immediate, you know, my to-do list and put, you know, another three or four, you know, the, the big ones on there on this weekly list. And then I take that weekly list and I feed them into my calendar. So I make meetings with myself in my calendar for, you know, two hours working on that article. And now I'm making that video um, a couple of hours doing that and obviously I add into the calendar you know things like this the call we, we'd organize to do this so by the end of the meeting I've got in my head what my priorities are for the week and then they're all scheduled in my calendar for the week and that with that, that I found that to be really useful scheduling meetings with myself rather than only having my calendar having meetings with other people on it which of course I try and minimize anyway um, my calendar is absolutely full of meetings with myself so I can just print out my calendar every day and whenever I've got like downtime in between tasks or you know I finish something I just look at it and I know what I should be doing next um, and it does force me to stop messing about and procrastinating and scanning Facebook or whatever and just get on and do the next thing on there so that weekly planning meeting drives everything the whole week excellent I have to smile for two things first of all the you know the meeting with yourself you're basically scheduling <laughs> your, your whole week with meetings <laughs> just <laughs> yourself and the second thing that made me smile is is the English uh, pronunciation of scheduling which always ah. Oh, yes. I, I, you know, I never know because I, most of my clients are actually American. So I, I, I flit between pronunciation is schedule, schedule, who, <laughs> who knows what the correct one is. Yeah, who knows? But it's just interesting. <laughs> it sounds completely different. So, yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, uh, you know, keeping yourself accountable is um, is a big part of, uh, of success. And I think planning, having goals and all that everyone has to find their own system and I, I, I think a, a weekly meeting Monday morning sounds, sounds you know, good to me. It sounds fun. I, I really enjoy it. I really enjoy getting out, going out, having my coffee, sitting there, you know, and, and I, but I do, I completely agree with you. You're absolutely right. You have to find your own system. I think sometimes your system changes over time as well when you get a bit bored with, you know, your little to-do method of putting it in an app or using paper or whatever. You know, you can switch it around, but you have to find something that works for you. Um, so other people's might be different, but I can recommend just taking some time out of your diary at the start of every week. It might be Sunday night, it might be Monday morning or whatever, with yourself just to plan things. Yeah. And I definitely recommend putting things in your calendar, meetings with yourself, because otherwise everybody else takes priority. Yeah. And, you know, when, you're, when you are um, running your own business, the, especially doing the kind of thing that I do where I'm creating training material and stuff that's my most valuable time yes. is the time I'm creating so I have to protect that and uh, shedding it in my calendar you know I can't meetings can't go into my calendar because I've already got time with me in there 
Of course, yeah, exactly. And, and you need to be able to say no uh, to other stuff if they want to overbook that time. Yes. So you're like, no, no, that's booked. That's Ooh, my meeting, yeah. you know, very important meeting. You don't that's say right. that it's with yourself. Uh, absolutely. You know, it, it is no, yeah. it's strange. You Non-negotiable. Know, psychologically, you would know that you can't spend, but you don't. If yeah. your diary is free and someone says, can I meet for an hour? You say, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. But if you've got that meeting with yourself in there, you say, oh, no, actually, I'm busy then. Can we yeah. do it a couple of days later? Yeah. Cool. What about an internet resource or an app or something that you'd like to share? Okay, I've got two things. Um, one, one that I use quite a lot is Snagit, um, or the, there's a free version called Jing. Um, it's from TechSmith, I think. Um, and basically, it's just a little thing that sits on your desktop, and you, it just lets you record either screenshots or videos, so you can video what's going on on your screen, and obviously you can talk over into the microphone into it. Um, and, and the nice thing about it it, 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 it lets you upload it to their servers for free, so you can and automatically creates a link to it, so you can then share that with people. So I use that a lot. If like a, a client or someone who's in my membership program says, you know, oh Ian, I'm really struggling to, you know, to set up that landing page and I can't get the, this tool to work, I just go onto my screen, press record, re, you know, record me doing it, and say, oh well, what you do is you click this button here, and then from this drop down you do this, you know, stop, save it upload it to the to the cloud and send them the link and say here here's the way to do it yeah. um and that just works brilliantly and they, it feels very personal as well because it's me chatting into it um i don't have to talk to them but I, but i'm but it feels <laughs> like i'm talking to them because i'm chatting into the screen right. um and, and there you go so it re it really is lovely for people and jing, as i say jing is the free version i think it lets you record about five minutes Snagit is usually on sale somewhere and it lets you edit um and uh, upload longer versions and stuff. It's a really great tool. But I ought to, remember, I ought to mention another tool that um, I use quite a lot and, and I find really funny, <laughs> but, but very helpful. And there are different versions of this, but the one I use is for Google Chrome, and it's called, I'm just going to look up the exact name, it's called HTML5. Where is it? EFGH. I'm just looking at my list of extensions. HTML5 Video Speed Control. And basically what it does is whenever you're browsing the web through Chrome, um, whenever there's a video on the screen, um, whether that's a YouTube video or an embedded video from some kind of service or whatever, it just overlays a little plus and minus button for you to speed up that video. So any video I'm watching on the web, I can watch at double speed or triple speed. Well, at triple speed, you probably couldn't hear what they were saying. But up to about double speed or 1.75 speed, you can actually hear all the words people are saying, but you get to watch it twice as quick. <laughs> so if you've ever been through any of those really, do, you know, you know, when you want, you want to watch a video or it's a recording of a webinar or something like that, and it's up there on the web, and you're thinking, yeah, it's great, there's some great information, but oh, I wish they would go a bit quicker. Yeah. You, you just press the button, boom, 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 and they're going twice as fast. I hope it doesn't work for podcasts, otherwise people would be scanning. I don't through. think it works for audio, <laughs> not especially not if it's coming out of iTunes, it's just for video. Okay, uh, good. So there you go. Uh, Excellent. Maybe yeah. you should go faster with it with me, though. I don't know. But <laughs> no. I, I just find, but it's all. I I like it because firstly, it makes me really much more productive. I can listen to things. Yeah, faster. no, it happens to me all the time where I'm thinking, oh, I wish I could fast forward. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Of course, it sounds funny because the voice goes all high pitched and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so They'll definitely be looking that one up. Cool. What about a book that you, I'm um, assuming that you're also a big reader, most introverts are. So uh, do you have any books that you would recommend or, or one book that you would recommend to the I'm, audience? I'm going to recommend a book that has probably the worst title. It's a book I read years ago, um, which I still have a copy of. I've got the latest version now. Actually, the audio book's really great as well. Um, it, it's, it's a book called Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play by Mahan Khalsa. And the um, the latest version, he's also co-authored it with Randy Illig. Um, the audiobook version's great because uh, Mahan's a brilliant presenter. He's very funny. Um, but the book is, you would never guess it from the name, but the book is about selling for consultants and people like that. Um, and it is a method, a process for selling your consulting or other service uh, services that's very friendly to people who are introverts, who aren't pushy, who really want to help people. So there are some really useful interpersonal techniques in there, um, like making no an okay answer t so that y y you know y the other person doesn't feel pressured. Like if you're feeling, uh, the nice little phrase he uses, like if you feel it, find a way to say it. 
So mm. if you're feeling that, and I think the example he gives in the book was he, he was talking to a potential client um, who's already using McKinsey for something, and you know, it, all inside he was saying, well, "Why aren't they just going to use McKinsey for this? Why am I, you know, surely I'm wasting my time pitching for this business? They're just going to use McKinsey." And then he finally just blurted it out. He said, "You know what? If I was you, I'd just be using McKinsey. We've had a bunch of great projects with them. Why not just use them?" And the guy went, "You're right, but in this particular case." What we're looking for is X, Y, and Z that they can't do, which, of course, then told him exactly what he needed <laughs> to include in his proposal. But on the other hand, sometimes what might have happened there is the guy would have went, you know, you're right. We probably are thinking of going with McKinsey. They do a great job. It's just that, you know, we have to talk to other people, in which case you're not going to invest a whole lot of time and energy. Or, of course, if, you know, if there's an interpersonal thing going on you, you, where you just get the feeling that someone isn't comfortable with what you're saying, usually what, what we do is we plow on and just keep talking away um, because we don't want to get into an uncomfortable situation. But again, he would, you know, if, if, if you feel it, then just say, you know, I'm getting the, the feeling you're not quite buying what I'm saying here and you don't seem comfortable with it. Is that right? And then just leave it. And of course, the person will say, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not. I, yeah. I'm not convinced this is the right thing for us. And, and it's much better to get stuff out on the table than, mm -hmm. than it is to just pretend and then find out afterwards they didn't believe a word you were saying or, or whatever it might be. Yeah. Wow, sounds like a very interesting book indeed for, for non pushy selling, right? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, it's that's it's what such we're a bad all name about. You would you would never know from the name Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play. <laughs> no, it's actually it's true. <laughs> he should re revisit this title. <laughs> very good. Well we're coming to an end here, uh, Ian, and I always like to ask you know, kind of have a, a this mindful ending and say and ask you what you're grateful for this week. You know, I have been really grateful for the, the, the uh, not you're not in this situation uh, as you just said earlier, but I'm really grateful for the weather. We've just <laughs> summer has finally arrived in the UK. <laughs> My wife Kathy and I have just been out for a walk. So we went for about a five mile walk, had a coffee, walked back. Um, brilliant. Uh, yeah. That is one of the joys of working for yourself. Uh, the, you know the ability. So I guess that's the other thing I'm grateful for: the fact I have kind of freedom with my time. Um, to do what I what I want most of the time. Nobody ever has complete freedom. But uh, so Kathy and I just went out, had a lovely walk, had a nice chat, talked about stuff, and really set for the week. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. It's it's that sunshine, but also the fact that you can, you know, just go out at lunch or, or yeah. even you know it doesn't even have to be at lunch. You could go out, you know, now as well because mm. you could just say, okay. You know, I take a break now rather than like everybody at lunch. And so mm. you could just you know, do it. You know, it actually took me years to get over feeling guilty. When, if I was out, um, yeah. you know, if I walked out for coffee at, you know, two in the afternoon or ten in the morning and just sat and read the newspaper or whatever or had a chat with my wife, because it was working hours, mm -hmm. there would be something inside me say, oh, you should be working. You should be working now yeah. because you'd always been working at those hours when you had a proper job. And it took me years to get over that. Yeah. But I'm, thankfully, I'm over it now. Good, good for you. <laughs> well, thank you. This has been great, Ian. I really enjoyed talking to you and I'm sure the audience uh, has enjoyed listening. So I'll make sure to put all the resources you've shared in the show notes and, um, and, and also mention where people can find you. I'll put a link to your um, website and I noticed you have a special introvert page. So I'll make sure to uh, put them there and uh, really enjoy talking to you. So thank you for having that time with me today. Brilliant, been a real pleasure. You can find Ian on his website at ianbrody.com or on Facebook, that's facebook.com forward slash ian.brody. Next time it will be just me and I still need to come up with a good topic. If you'd like me to cover anything specific, please leave a comment underneath the show notes. That's it for this episode of the Introvert Biz Growth Podcast. Please come and download the three golden nuggets cheat sheet that Ian shared with us today at saracenencroce.com. And if you don't have it yet, get your free four-step guide on how to say no to grow. If you like this episode, please subscribe to this show on iTunes or Stitcher and tell your introverted friends about it. I'll talk to you in two weeks. I know it seems long, but time flies and pre-excitement is half the experience. <laughs>